Welcome back, Petapixel viewers. It is Chris Nichols here, and I'm coming to you again from beautiful Wetzlar, Germany. We are here at the Leica headquarters to see the brand new Leica SL3. Now, it is gonna be still a few hours before I get our hands on it, so Jordan's shooting on the S5-2X right now, but we will get it. I wanna start off though, press trips, I never sleep. I don't know what it is, guilty conscious, I don't know. I'm on like three hours of sleep. Okay, uh, hey, just a quick question. How much sleep did you get last night? Loads, 12. 12? F you, keep going. So I'm only telling you this whole sleep thing because, you know, presenting on camera, me not gonna talk so good, I don't think, over the next two days unless I get some rest. Anyways, okay, so we've heard about the camera. We got to see a presentation on it. It is a pre-production camera, so keep in mind this is just first impressions. I even tried to touch one, but they didn't even let me do that. So in about, I don't know, what, four, four hour, hours, four hours, uh, we're gonna get the cameras. Jordan is gonna shoot the majority of the episode on an SL3 as well, so don't worry, you'll get to see the footage from that. And uh, I'm gonna try to get some sleep. Hopefully, we're only shooting today and tomorrow. Hopefully, I get more rest. Oh, oh dude. Oh, no. oh, sorry, sir, sorry, sorry. Okay, so while Chris hopefully is able to catch some sleep, he never can on these trips. I don't understand what is wrong with him. I wanna talk about our friends at KEH. And if you're watching a video about a Leica camera, you know that what truly defines us is the camera that hangs from our neck. So you probably wanna get like a classy vintage one. And our friends at KEH can absolutely help you out with that. They have a huge warehouse of cameras for you to look at, and they will guarantee that those are properly functioning. So let's say you wanna grab a Leica camera. Well, they've been making them for like 100 years. There's so many to choose from. How are you gonna know what is the right one for you? Well, thankfully, KEH has their gear experts that you can reach out to. They will answer all of your questions about the different features or functionality of all of these amazing cameras. So whether you wanna buy, sell, or trade, check out KEH. They are Petapixel's preferred pre-owned partner. It's so many Ps. I'm gonna go see if Chris is ready. Okay, so we finally got the cameras. Jordan's shooting on the SL3. I've got an SL3 in my hands. I tried napping, disaster, never works. I'll just fight through it. It'll be what it'll be. So first off, let's just talk about how this camera is similar to the SL2 and how it has also changed as far as the body handling goes. This is the smallest SL series camera we've seen so far. It is a few millimeters shorter, a few millimeters less wide. It's also saving a little bit of weight. So this is 762 grams to the body down from 838 from the SL2. It's not like a huge noticeable difference, but certainly the camera does handle nicely. It's fairly compact and it does still have that beautiful grip. Now the EVF we have seen before, it's the exact same hardware that we had in the SL2, 5.76 million dots, which is decent. Great magnification. I mean, I do like the way they've built the eye cup further away from the screen as well. So one of the main complaints on the SL2 was the screen. It was perfectly fine resolution. The problem was it didn't articulate at all. It was fixed to the back of the camera, which is of course awkward when you're doing photography at lower angles or above your head. So we now have a jump on the panel up to 2.3 million dots, which is nice. More importantly though, it now fully articulates to be a waist level finder. Nice articulation there if I wanna shoot above or down below. Another thing too is it's still quite slim. It's not really interfering with the eye relief on the eye cup, and yet when when I pull it up, the eye cup is also not gonna block the screen. So it seems to be a well-implemented design. So you got the same rubber doors covering the ports here, mic jack, headphone jack, full-size HDMI, and USB-C. This will charge through USB-C. You do not necessarily have to have a PD-rated charger. Even if you just have a weak charger and the camera's off, it will charge up the battery, albeit slowly. You can also power the camera through USB-C. So if you have at least 27 watts going to the thing, you will power the camera and also charge the battery at the same time. And I mean, most of us now have 50 watt or 100 watt chargers. So you should be able to absolutely power the camera and charge at any time you want. The last thing I wanna mention here on this side, under our door, we now have CF Express B as well as one SD UHS-2 speed card slot. This is different than the SL2 having twin SD card slots. And I think this is really nice because we've got bigger files now. We're gonna want that extra throughput, not only for video, but also photography. As far as the body goes, I do love the new font with the big like on the front. I mean, it's a handsome looking camera, absolutely. It is still a rugged body, IP54 weather rating, so that means dust proof, even like water jets proof, splashing, rugged conditions, freezing temperatures. So it is the kind of camera you can take into rugged environments. Let's then talk about the new sensor. So this has a 60 megapixel sensor. This is what we expected. It's about time. We've seen this sensor in the M11 and the Q3, but I wanna give some context here before we talk about the 
the sensor because yes, we've seen 60 megapixel sensors from Leica before, but they actually have different dynamic range. So when you look at things like the charts from photons to photos, or even just confirming through Leica themselves, the Q3 had a 60 megapixel sensor with a base ISO of 100, but that was actually slightly lower dynamic range than what we saw on the M11 with its 60 megapixel sensor, which had a base ISO of 64. Now, here on the SL3, the base ISO is also 100. Again, this is pre-production, so we can't really test this fully, but it does make us think that this might have the lower dynamic range like the Q3 does, rather than the higher dynamic range that the M11 has. However, one thing that this brand new sensor does give us is hybrid phase and contrast detect autofocus with subject detection. Of course, this is something we absolutely expected to see and we do have it here, but before I really talk about it, I wanna give it a good test. So actually, I think the bus is almost here for our first shooting experience, so let's go to that now. Okay, so we're at our first location, uh, hour long bus ride, I didn't sleep at all, but Jordan did get half an hour, didn't you, Jordan? You get a, doing great. You have a gift, so. We're at uh, Und Nationals Auto Museum, and we're going to see the Low Collection. Should be good. So this lovely recreation of a cinema inspires me to tell you what Jordan's shooting right now as far as video settings go. So he's shooting handheld in this low light situation to test that stabilizer, 8K, 24P, and he's using autofocus. That'll also be an interesting test given that the light in here is quite low. So one new design feature here on this camera is the on off switch. It's basically a power button that looks more at home on a PC computer than it does on a camera. So I will say this, I'm not accidentally turning the camera on. I can just press it and actually the startup time is very quick. What I am finding a little strange is when I want to turn it off, I have to diligently hold it down. I mean, I get that. They don't want you to accidentally bump it and turn your camera off. That would be frustrating, but I am missing the convenience of just having a switch that I could flick with my finger. So, you know, it's a good thing that we live in modern times because the SL3 features a brand new shutter as well as a brand new IBIS mechanism. But in order to make the camera body physically smaller, something they really wanted to do, and this might come as a slap to the face for some of you, the shutter mechanism had to be redesigned and it's actually got a slower shutter sync for flashes. It only goes up to 1 200th of a second as opposed to 1 250th like we had in the SL2. Also, this does have an IBIS system, but that also had to be redesigned to fit in the smaller body. And so it gives us five stops of stabilization rather than five and a half stops like we had in the SL2. Now in a studio situation, that slower flash sync speed is not gonna be that big a deal. And I'm still finding the image stabilization to be working very effectively, even in low light situations situations like this, but it's rare that we see a camera downgrade from a previous model when it comes to these specs. Oh, this is adorable. This reminds me of you, Jordan, because I think you could parallel park this car, right? You and me could tour around Germany in this little two-seater. Wouldn't that be nice? You're my little Kleinstwagen. Fifteenth of a second, it's so dark. Oh, okay, finally. Mm, no, no sex, man. No way. I don't want the sex right now. Okay, so it's day two, seven in the morning. We're coming to you here from the beautiful old town section of Wetzlar. And uh, we're here because I couldn't sleep. I got five hours of sleep last night. I don't know, I just, it was terrible. So I don't know, Jordan, add it to the clock. Anyways, Jordan's a champ, he came with me. Might as well take some pictures. Okay, so we were shooting yesterday. We've been shooting this morning. We've had time to test the battery life on this camera. And I do consider this to be one of the weaknesses on the Leica SL3 system. So. 
First off, this uses the newer SL6 series battery, the same thing that we found in the Leica Q3. We're getting about 250 to 260 SEPA rated shots. I know SEPA rating doesn't mean very much. You'll get more than that in practical situations, but that's still far less than what you'll get with competitive cameras. And so shooting at the event yesterday at the car collection for a couple hours, my battery life was down to half. I actually swapped out batteries just to make sure that I was topped up. Jordan's been shooting video and he's finding he might be getting around 40 minutes of record time before a battery drains. So this is tough. You really want to make sure that you have spares uh, and maybe even a couple of them. Now you can use the older battery that we get in the SL2, the Q2. These batteries will function in the camera, but with even less lifespan, you're also going to find that you don't get high speed burst ratings and you lose 4K and 8K recording. So it really does pay to have the newer SL6 batteries. I do also have to say that I'm being very diligent when turning the camera on and off or using sleep mode. It's just not the kind of camera that I can flick on and walk around and comfortably not worry about the battery life slowly draining. Okay, so let's talk about autofocus performance now on the SL3. Remember, this is still a pre-production camera, but I'm pretty pleased with the autofocus performance I'm getting. Overall, I'm gonna preface this by saying it feels a lot like the experience I would get out of a Panasonic S5 II, which I suppose makes sense. So this is like Leica's first phase detect hybrid with contrast detect autofocusing in an SL camera. And so what I'm finding here is first off, tracking actually seems to be pretty sticky, not bad. You know, it's tracking moving subjects well. Uh, I do also like that I've got human detect uh, it's picking up either full bodies, faces, or eyes, as depending on the distance that I'm getting. Now, as far as other subject detection modes go, we don't have the same array that we're finding on contemporary cameras, which means we don't have things like planes and trains and automobiles, motorsports, that kind of stuff. We do have Animal Detect. It's still in beta firmware here, but that being said, I mean, we did find some interesting ducks down by the water and uh, it is drawing boxes around them. It seems to be focusing on them accurately. The only issue is I lose quite a bit of EVF resolution while continuously autofocusing. And this is unfortunate because if you want to shoot street photography, sports, wildlife and you get that drop in resolution that's very distracting. I'm also finding still the tendency to wobble and continuous autofocus in the background. Again these are things that most other brands of companies have rectified. Hopefully with firmware updates we can see changes here to the SL3 as well. So one of the major changes to the Leica SL3 is the user interface. Now, first off, the button controls I think are great. I like the six customizable buttons. They have moved the three buttons, the playback function and menu over to the right, just like we see in the Leica Q3. Now, Leica have always been famous for having a very simple touch interface that works well. I can long press a custom button or long press one of the tiles in the menu and change it to pretty much whatever I want. In the menu system itself, we used to have 12 tiles and they've reduced the clutter down to eight tiles. I still think that's plenty. Leica's also updated the iconography that they use. They call them Lycons, adorable. So it's just basically making them a little bit easier to see, a little bit larger, a little bit less cluttered. And I think that's a positive step for sure. Basically, the beauty of the system here is that although it does take a while to customize these cameras the way that you like, you do have that freedom. And once you've set it up, you basically don't have to spend any time in the menu systems. And that is really a nice way to handle a camera. Everything's literally at your fingertips with the touchscreen interface. Another big change that I really like, when you do have your screen on and you've got all of your icons at the top here, you know, ISO, autofocus, white balance, you can long press any of those right on the screen and change them directly there there as well so it's very convenient also when I turn the camera sideways I like that all the icons stay where they are but they just rotate 90 degrees so that I can still read them properly Okay, so now let's go over to Jordan to talk about video on the Leica SL3. He's been annoyingly peppy and energetic these last few days because the fact is we both sleep like babies, him in the classical sense, me in the sense where the baby wakes up at two in the morning screaming and then you gotta go change it and it's really annoying and you're incredibly exhausted Why don't and tired. Just let me talk now. Okay, so let's go over to Jordan. Hey, it's a very refreshed Jordan Drake to talk about the Leica SL3 when you're shooting video and immediately looking at this camera, this looks like a pro video tool. I mean, you put it in the cinema display, you're getting things like shutter angle, it switches ISO to ASA for some reason, we have waveforms here. It's a lot of very serious video functionality. But I was immediately wary when I saw that this is using a 60 megapixel sensor because we've seen other cameras like the Sony a7R5 or the Sigma FPL that claim to have great video specs, but they're using that 60 megapixel sensor and that's because it reads quite slowly. So Leica has an interesting solution for that. What they're doing is they're applying, it looks like around a 1.3 crop to the footage to get it down to the 8K region. And it's using that region for 
4K up to 60 frames per second, and it's 8K recording. And when we're using the 4K and 8K, this does suffer from quite severe rolling shutter, as you can see in this example right here. Now, one of the huge upgrades is this does have phase detect autofocus, and the previous Leica SL2 definitely suffered from the wibbly wobblies like we see on some Panasonic cameras, a lot of kind of fast flutters, and we don't really see that here. The one thing though is if you've got a clean scene like we've got right here, one face in it, it actually has done a really nice job of tracking. However, things get a little busier, multiple people in the frame or lots of shadows, it can get quite confused. The nice thing is it's not just fluttering in and out of focus rapidly, it's drifting in and out of focus, but it's just not terribly consistent. As well, the stabilization I found really quite good when I'm trying to maintain a static frame, but if I'm walking with Chris, following something, I did find that it would kind of stick a little bit. It was a little bit jerky when I'm trying to do like deliberate camera movements, and I wish there was an option in the menu to adjust that. So there are definitely some limitations, but it's still capable of getting nice looking video with the natural profile, the ability to record in their L log. But I need to take a moment and talk about one of the most frustrating things I've dealt with with a camera in a very long time. And that's the way that you set up your recording modes on it. Now, typically how I think about a scene is what is the frame rate I'm shooting at? Then what's the resolution? then what's the codec, then what's the data rate that I'm going to use. But it has a maddening system where, say I want to do 4K 10-bit, I'll set up 4K at 24 frames per second, and then it's like, well, I want something fairly efficient, maybe I'll go to H.265. When I kick it to H.265, it jumps the resolution to 8K, because 8K is the only mode that uses H.265. The most egregious example is this camera offers ProRes, which is a very high-end function, but for some reason it's only available in 1080p. I don't know why they even bothered to license ProRes for this, but I constantly find I'm setting up the camera exactly how I want it, then I go to change one of the fiddlier settings, like the codec or the data rate, and it's screwing up all my other camera settings and it's absolutely maddening. The thing is they could definitely fix this in firmware. I'm sorry everybody, I just, I had to get that off my chest. So yes, this is a little bit of a limited camera if you're planning to use it as a primary video tool and that's why I strongly suspect we'll see like a Leica SL3S coming out that's a little bit more optimized for video in the future. So right now if you're looking for a very high-end photo camera and recording the odd video clips, this camera is going to be just fine. But if you're looking for a major hybrid camera, then I probably wouldn't look at the SL3. So I know we've already touched a little bit on the image quality on the SL3, but now that I've had a chance to take a look at files in different situations and environments, even though this is pre-production, there are some things that we can conclude. First off, we know what this sensor is capable of. Beautiful detail, tons of resolution, natural looking noise at high ISO, a unique tonality and color palette that Leica achieved that you don't really see with other brands. Again, you can throw that all out. You can change the color however you want, but they really do have a beautiful look to their images. And so that is going to be one of the big pluses going to a camera like this. Now, for most of us, 60 megapixels is going to be plenty of detail. It's all you'll ever need. However, it's important to understand that cameras like the Leica SL2 had a multi-shot mode to get more detail. And certainly the competition against the SL3, many of those cameras also feature multi-shot mode. This is something that Leica recognizes, but as of yet, you still have no multi-shot mode on the SL3. That might be something we see change in firmware later. So one thing I'm concerned about here on the Leica SL3 is it's just not that fast a shooting camera, not at least in practical terms. What I mean by that, look, the autofocus experience was actually quite nice. It was very accurate, but if I was shooting journalism, street photography, action or wildlife, something like that, there's some stuff here that lets me down. I mean, yes, the camera can shoot 15 frames per second mechanical, but that's without any sort of autofocus. And going to electronic shutter to get higher burst rates, I mean, this sensor does have a lot of rolling shutter, so you really want to avoid that. But when it comes to continuous autofocus, tracking subjects, eye detect, that kind of stuff, we're gonna do a lot of that work. I'm really maxed out at five frames per second at 12-bit raw files. If I go to four frames per second, which is where I primarily shot, then I can get 14-bit quality. But that means that effectively this camera is a four frame per second camera unless I'm okay with locked off autofocus. 
And I just can't help but feel like this is a bit of an odd situation. I mean, they've doubled the buffer on this camera over the SL2. It's now eight gigs of RAM. I mean, that's great. I'm not complaining. And we have the CF Express Type B slot, which is a faster slot. That's great. I'm not complaining. But unless I'm locking off my autofocus, I don't feel like I'm ever going to push that buffer to that limit. Shooting four or five frames per second, it's kind of a non-issue. And fast SD card slots would be able to handle that, especially when you consider our video features on this camera aren't really pushing the need for a safe express type B slot either. Now, what if you're already invested into full frame L mount lenses, whether they be Leica or Panasonic or Sigma, whatever, and you're now looking for a higher resolution body? Well, the Leica SL3 does make the most sense. I mean, it is currently the best high res 60 megapixel full frame camera in L mount. The Sigma FPL, I just wouldn't do it. I mean, the lack of mechanical shutter, the terrible rolling shutter you get with that sensor, the poor handle. I mean, we don't even have to go into that. This is absolutely the choice right now. But at the same time, I can't help but think, what is Panasonic going to come out with shortly in the future? Certainly, there's got to be a high resolution body on the horizon for them, and it might be worth waiting for that. Now, lastly, there's going to be the buyer that's just really into Leica. I mean, they love the color, the tonality, the heritage, the image quality. Those are all fair points. Or there's going to be people that are already invested into the Leica ecosystem. Maybe you've got a Q3, maybe you've got an M series camera, and now you want a mirrorless camera like this to complement it. This is then a very compelling camera because the SL3, the improvements that they've made over the SL2 are substantial and it is a much better camera. And despite a lot of the quirks that this has, I still really enjoy the images I got out of it and the experience of shooting it. And that is important. Now, for me personally, I've had an interesting relationship with Leica because when I started reviewing cameras and then for many years after that, I never really appreciated the brand. I was really more the kind of guy that appreciates good bang for your buck and practicality and versatility and like it didn't really represent that for me. And it's taken quite a few years for me to start to realize that sometimes it's more about the shooting experience and, and the heritage and, and just what it makes you feel when you're taking those pictures, the fun factor. And for me, I still think the M series and the Q series have that. The SL3 doesn't personally grab me the exact same way. So. I might go for something that I feel is maybe more versatile than the SL3 myself. But I do want to address something. I do think a lot of people write off the brand saying things like, oh, it's just for dentists, it's just for doctors, it's just a wealthy toy. And I think that way is pretty closed-minded way of thinking. I think you're really missing out on the fact that if you're going to have them made here in Wetzlar, Germany, with a lot of hands-on engineering to very exacting standards, beautiful design in limited numbers, the cameras are going to be more expensive than what you'd see across the market. So whether the SL3 is a boutique toy for the rich or a compelling product, I will leave that up to you. Thanks for sticking around with me. I know I'm pretty tired right now and I'm probably not making a lot of sense. But if you have any comments that you'd like to add, definitely leave those below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We'd appreciate that. Listen to our podcast. It's on the exact same channel or all your favorite podcasting apps. You just got to search for Petapixel Podcast and you will find it. I am working on, I don't know what the tally is, eight hours of sleep over two days or something like that. So I think it's finally time, now the review is done, for me to go to bed. So... We'll see you guys soon with more episodes on Petapixel. Ooh. Oh, I don't even care if it's a public lobby. I'm going to bed. I, I guess I'll just leave. Yeah, quiet. I know. Yeah, quiet. Bedtime.